Welcome to the VDM project. I'm Dr. Jerry Sabag, and along with Fabio Gallerani, uh, we have worked uh, diligently for several years. And the purpose of today's uh, presentation is to update you on the status at year's end for 2025. I'd like to begin by thanking Fabio for spearheading the VDM project and promoting it as a source of education and support for patients who suffer from floaters. One of the big problems with floaters uh, stems from a lack of appreciation by uh, clinicians and scientists for the importance of vitreous in uh, the health of the eye and also the role that vitreous plays in various diseases. So there's a general disregard for vitreous to begin with. And then added on top of that is a lack of appreciation for the etiology of floaters, for the impact that floaters have on patients' vision and on their quality of life, and the absence of tools to evaluate patients in a respectful scientific way. And the uh, collection, the, the collective effects of what I just described result in the frustration that many patients with floaters have when they interact with uh, the medical profession. The lack of appreciation, the lack of understanding, and lack of methodologies to evaluate patients uh, results in a very frustrating experience for patients. And I feel for you, and Fabio and I have dedicated years of effort to address those problems. In 2025, we made some major inroads, which I'm very happy to share with you. Concerning vitreous in general, we have published uh, two chapters and completed and submitted a third chapter in major textbooks on vitreous. And each of those chapters contains information relevant to the role of vitreous uh, in health, but also in disease of various types. One of those diseases is vision degrading myodysopsia, which is the term that we've introduced to refer to clinically significant vitreous floaters. So including that information in chapters that appear in major textbooks, will raise the level of awareness and will uh, set the stage for uh, opening people's minds concerning the role of vitreous and um, specifically how floaters result from changes in vitreous. Another problem that has existed for many years is that when a patient goes to a doctor and is evaluated for floaters, the doctor doesn't really know what tests to do. There are very few insightful, precise, informative tests that can provide the kind of data that uh, the medical profession uses in order to evaluate the situation and determine is the condition mild, is it moderate, is it severe? Uh, there's been a lack of those methodologies. So we have spent a lot of time developing uh, diagnostics for the purpose of improving the evaluation of patients with floaters. Uh, we published uh, in May of 2025 a major uh, landmark paper, really, that was published by the American Academy of Ophthalmology that summarized our two-decade experience in evaluating and treating 651 patients with vision-degrading myodysopsia. This is arguably the world's largest series, certainly the largest series from a single center. And our purpose in submitting and then publishing this paper was to share with the world our experience in identifying patients who benefit or would benefit from intervention, specifically limited refractive vitrectomy. But perhaps more importantly, we've developed insights into how to identify people who don't need intervention and who can be observed based upon various different criteria. 
in respect to the methodologies that are employed in um, the evaluation, historically, the two main evaluations have been quantitative ultrasonography, where the structure of the vitreous is not just evaluated qualitatively, but also quantitatively. So we get numbers on the degree of density uh, within the vitreous body. That links directly to visual function because unfortunately, visual acuity, which is what most of ophthalmology relies upon, is not a very informative way to evaluate a patient's vision when their chief complaint is floaters. We've discovered that measuring contrast sensitivity is far more informative. And there's a correlation between the density of the vitreous as measured by ultrasonography and the degradation in contrast sensitivity. And so we employed that and we presented all of those results in the paper I alluded to uh, in those 651 patients who we've treated over the years. But recently, we've developed a self-administered questionnaire that required very careful and comprehensive scientific validation in order to be useful in patients complaining of floaters. And in October of 2025, the American Medical Association published a paper on the validation studies of the questionnaire that we call the VFFQ23. That stands for Vitreous Floaters Functional Questionnaire, and the 23 refers to the fact that there are 23 questions in that questionnaire. And in that publication, we've shown that there's a high correlation between the patient's representation of the impact of the floaters on their visual quality of life and the various things that um, they do uh, throughout life and the vitreous structure as quantified by ultrasonography and the vision as measured by contrast sensitivity. So the worse the results on the questionnaire correlated with uh, more dense vitreous and that correlated with poor contrast sensitivity. So we now have three very powerful ways to evaluate patients with floaters, both subjectively, but also objectively with quantitative metrics. We are in the process, in the closing stages of being accepted by the uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology for a study that compared this self-administered questionnaire, the VFFQ23, to what's been considered for the last two or three decades as the gold standards of questionnaires, that being the National Eye Institute Visual Function Questionnaire, colloquially referred to as the VFQ25, because there are 25 questions in the VFQ, the Visual Function Questionnaire. And we found uh, in comparing the uh, two questionnaires in a series of patients who completed both questionnaires multiple times over the course of a few years, we found superiority to the VFFQ23 over the VFQ25. And the reason for that is that each question in the VFFQ23 has the word floaters in it and specifically queries the impact that floaters have on uh, different aspects of life. So uh, we're very pleased to, to have produced this and um, to be able to continue to develop this for application in different clinical settings. The other area that we've been active in is um, the therapeutic area. And this has been a very eye-opening experience for me in 2025 because we completed a collaborative study invited by the Retina Clinic in London, and uh, the purpose of that study was to test the efficacy of YAG laser vitreolysis on patients with floaters. I have to admit, as many of you may already know, that for a very long time I was skeptical about whether YAG laser vitreolysis would work or not. And I finally decided to stop sharing opinions and start sharing data. And in order to do that, I had to generate data. So we used our metrics, the questionnaire, 
the quantitative ultrasound and measuring contrast sensitivity in patients who were treated with YAG laser vitreolysis. And we measured them before and then during and after the treatment sessions. And whereas I was skeptical that it would have any benefit, I was wrong. Once I opened my mind and once I opened my eyes to the possibility that it would be effective, and once we applied our uh, established quantitative metrics, we discovered that somewhere upwards of 85% of patients who we've treated were very happy and had better contrast sensitivity and had less dense vitreous after the laser treatments. We have submitted that information for a presentation at ARVO, which is the world's largest eye research meeting, to be held this, or rather next year, in Denver, Colorado, uh, between May 3rd and May 7th. So we will be presenting these results at this international eye research meeting. But it represents the first evidence ever generated with scientific objective outcome measures that there is benefit to YAG laser vitreolysis. Now, it's important with this treatment, as with any treatment for any disease, that the proper cases be selected. And we have identified what those cases appear to be, at least at the present point in time, and we'll be sharing that information with the world um, in, in about six months. So the information that I've shared with you has been very exciting and very informative and um, continues our uh, legacy of contributing scientific information on the subject of floaters. And I'd just like to close with a uh, publication out of a university in China that um, reviewed the number of publications and the number of citations throughout the world on the subject of vitreous and floaters between 1999 and 2023. And during that 25 year period of time, these researchers identified, and let me quote from their paper, the annual number of publications and citations in the world dramatically increased. And they go on to say that the efficacy and safety of management for vitreous floaters turned out to be a recent hot spot. And so there is increased interest and increased activity in the domain of vitreous floaters. And both the diagnostic aspects and the therapeutic aspects are being studied very carefully. Uh, the study also identified that we were the most productive uh, um, individuals uh, during this 25-year period of time. And I'm very proud to be able to share that with you, but I'm also very grateful to the participation of the many patients who were involved in the studies that I described for you earlier uh, and also those individuals who have supported the VMR Research Foundation by donating through the VDM Project website to support our work. So uh, again, I'm very grateful to Fabio Gallerani for his leadership and organization. I'm very uh, grateful to all of the individuals in the VDM Project and to all of you uh, please know that I want to leave you with the most important word I believe that I can share, and that is the word hope. You should have great hope because I think the future is bright. And I'd like to wish everyone a happy holiday season and good health for 2026.